but I think the greatest opportunity for revival when it happens, it's like a small fire, then it can spread. Welcome back to the show today, folks. So we have a very special guest and a friend of mine, uh, Mike Stevens here in uh, Texas. Uh, Mike has just uh, kind of updated his book. He's had a book out. It's kind of a classic book on revival. We'll put this in the show notes called Contending for Revival. It's an updated version. And along with that, he also has a audio book that he's come out with, uh, his topic is very timely for today, and uh, he just has a passion to see the church stirred up, uh, to quit being lukewarm, uh, to be on fire for God. He has a desire to travel the world, to see uh, people saved, to carry the gospel message to the farthest corners of the earth. And so, uh, Mike, my friend, thank you for your time today, sir. Thank you, Ken for sharing your podcast audience with me and helping me not only promote this book, but to contend for revival. That's the, the title is just not a title. It is the passion of my life in ministry. Yes. So let, let's just kind of start the title of contending for revival. Just give people a, a lot of people probably have never experienced revival. You know, you and I are a couple of old timers. And so, Maybe just tell us, what is revival? Well, you know, when I wrote the book, I knew what, about revival. You know, I cut my teeth on Charles Finney uh, in his book, Lectures of Revival, probably the greatest book on revival ever written. And, uh, and I hadn't personally experienced uh, a revival as a corporate revival. I think there's personal revivals when we ourselves uh, individually are uh, we have an encounter with God that awakens us. It's more than just saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. And now I'm going to pray this prayer and ask Jesus Christ to become Lord of my life. I'm going to turn from my sins. Uh, revival can only happen where there's been life. That's why it's revive. Uh, you can't revive somebody that's never existed. And so revival brings someone back to life. And even as Christians, we, we get this lethargic, look like apparently dead, losing the passion for God, for the things of God. And we go through the motions, you know, going to church on Sundays, putting tithe in the offering, uh, singing our songs. But yet when we walk out, we're not that much different. And we have this, this, uh, uh, little bitty, little bitty flame, maybe that's going out in our homes or in our personal life. And then we have an encounter with God and he lights us up. I mean, we're like a light set on a hill and we have this passion that, that throws us back into the book of Acts. Cause I think when you look at revival, even Martin Lloyd Jones, the, the reformer preacher at Westminster chapel in London, where a lot of our reformed preachers, they hail him as one of their apostles, I would say, you know, heroes. And Martin Lloyd Jones said in revival, it's always returning back to the book of Acts. And so in revival, you're going to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit with such power that those that are there seeking him, they'll, they'll be overcome by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. In Wesley's meetings, people were falling out under the power of the Spirit. There was laughter. There was groanings. Uh, in the Cane Ridge revival that Daniel Boone had invited people to come. And I think at one time, there I want to say 20,000 people had gathered out in a field at the Cane Ridge revival. And uh, they had manifestations of the Holy Spirit that would scare the normal operations of the church uh, because there's the power of God comes upon you. You know, when you have somebody that uh, is dead or apparently dead and they have them in the hospital, they put those electric pads upon them to shock them. And you'll see their whole body lift off of that uh, gurney. And, uh, and then they look at the, the, uh, 
see if he's still flatlined. If not, they put it back on him again. Boom. Then it starts getting the level. They set him aside, but they have brought him back to life. But the power that was upon his body to revive him was seen. And he knows now that he has had an encounter with God that is supernatural. And there's been a manifestation of the Holy Spirit present. And in the revival that we're talking about with contending for revival is a corporate revival, you know, that happens with, with a group of people that can spread uh, to groups of people or to a nation or to the world. And so it is basically returning back to the book of Acts, where the very beginning was the day of Pentecost when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit in power. And, uh, and the, the first manifestation then was speaking with other tongues and the people thought they were drunk, but the noise attracted the crowd that was going on in the upper room. So I don't know if that wind, like a mighty rushing wind, if that wind was... I would think it might be loud, but it drew the crowd. And uh, 3,000 was added to the church that day. And so in revival, all of that's happening. And at the same time, people are being converted. Hmm. What are some of the keys for, you know, uh, some people say, well, you know, my K, just chill out. Revival is a sovereign move of God. Whenever God gets ready. You know, he's going to awaken people or whatever, but isn't there, is there, is there preparation on, the, on our part as believers in this, as we participate in this? I believe there is, and I believe that's still the sovereignty of God. In his sovereignty, he's given us his word, and he says, you know, if, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you wish, and I'll give it to you. And so in his sovereignty, he laid out a plan for us to receive things in prayer. And I think A.W. Tozer, the one that said it, but he said, God waits on us to want him. And so our action of prayer, I don't think we're going to pray until we really see that there's a need for revival, that there's something empty missing, you know, and then we begin to pray. Uh, but I don't think you can have revival without prayer. You're not, you're not going to have revival without a hunger. God doesn't just come and fall upon a people that's not expecting. He, he's not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. And so people that are hungry for God, what was it in the wilderness when Moses was out there that God heard that said, I'm going to deliver my people from this slavery in Egypt. He said, I heard the cry of my people. And so there's a desperation that in God's sovereignty, his choice, you know, I can't make him move. But I think through God's compassion and love, he's always willing to move. And when he hears the cry of our heart and it's pure, it can't be for church growth. A lot of people want revival for church growth. God will not do that. All you want is a bigger church and a bigger name. And the glory belongs to the Lord. That's the one thing God says he doesn't share with man. He'll share praise, but he will not share glory. And I think a lot of people, they want excitement to draw a crowd thinking it's going to grow their church. But uh, I think prayer which is really, it happens with two or three people, four people. In the uh, uh, Hebrides revival in Scotland, there were two sisters that were in their 80s, and they were praying for, for, for revival. And it was those two ladies' prayers that I like to say caught God's attention. So you can also say God moved them to prayer. But in that also, obedience is greater than sacrifice. They still had to obey. But their hearts were so for God and in tune with God 
that he could move upon their hearts to pray. And they prayed and they believed God. And they said, revival is coming to this island. And they even had the man that was going to come preach there. And they contacted him and uh, or told the pastor to. He was a big name preacher, I guess, in England. They contacted him and he said he's got a conference. He's not coming. And the ladies told the pastor, send somebody down to pick him up when he gets off the boat and continue to uh, promote the revival because God said he's coming. And he was sitting on the platform getting ready to speak at this conference. And God spoke to him and said, if you don't go, I'm through with you. And he got up, leaned over to the guy, said, I can't speak. I got to go. He left the conference, got on a boat, landed there in Scotland. And those guys were sitting at the bank. He said, how did you know I was coming? I turned you down. They said, those two old ladies told us that God had told them. And revival broke out on that island. And thing about that revival is the, the first person that was converted, the young person, was Donald Trump's mother's cousin. Donald Trump's mother had already left the island and gone to New York. And but it was her family members that God first fell on them. And uh, and those two ladies, the aunts. Uh, I mean, those two old ladies were Donald Trump's mother's aunts. And they pray that God would pour his spirit on their offspring. So, you know, I don't want to read too much into that, but uh, it is something to think about how God uses people. But those two ladies prayed and God moved. And so I think the greatest thing is prayer. You got, you're not going to have it without prayer. We don't have anything without prayer. And then a hunger for God. And the church, they have a hunger for church growth. Their messages seem to be more for practical living, how to be a good husband, father, which we all need, but that's not the major. Jesus is the major. And, you know, God waits on us to want him. And he knows when that is a want that we want him or a selfish want. I want him just to move in my life. I want him to bless me. And so I think, I think, and this is kind of off the subject, Ken, but I think the greatest opportunity for revival when it happens, it's like a small fire, then it can spread. It's very difficult to have revival in a big prestigious church a well-known church because they got too much to lose. When the Holy Spirit shows up in power and does things that they cannot explain, that Christian apologetics can't explain, it messes up things. And they don't want to lose that. They got too much money to lose, too much reputation in the city to lose. If you look at revivals of history, the men that God used their reputation was shot. I mean, you look at, uh, uh, not well, Finney, they thought he was crazy. Preachers was against him. And, uh, and then you look at uh, William Booth. They basically kicked him out of his church. And then he went to a graveyard and began preaching. John Wesley, you know, they kicked him out. And he went and stood on a stump in a cemetery and preached and revival broke out, Whitfield. So all of these guys basically had nothing to lose. Therefore, they didn't compromise. It's very difficult when you've got a lot to lose. You got a great reputation. The city loves you. You know, all the preachers think you're, you're solid. And you don't want to lose that. And so when the Holy Spirit begins to fall and do things that he does, uh, they like to say, wait a minute, we need to back off on this. And we can quench the spirit. You know, we can quench the spirit by trying to continue the manifestations when God is lifted. But we can also quench the spirit by 
suppressing the manifestations of God. And, uh, and so, but, but I don't think you can have it without this hunger where you basically say, God, give me revival or death, which means I don't care what you do to me. You know, uh, I want revival, whatever it costs. If it, if it destroys my church, I want revival. I'm tired of a dead, you know, life in Christ because it's, it's, it's an oxymoron. We have life in Christ. We have joy. We have passion for Jesus, you know. But revival comes along because the church is dead. That's what revival's for. Mm -hmm. I, one of the things that I've heard said quite often, Mike, is that, you know, a lot of these churches, they'll have uh, two, three, or maybe even four services and everything, uh, you know, if you actually, the preacher's here, and if you look back up there, they've got a clock, and the seconds are running that, <clears throat> I don't know, the expression goes along the lines, and, and, and I don't know if it was attributed to Billy Graham or not way back when, but said something along the lines that if the Holy Spirit of God wanted to move in our churches, we don't have time for him to move. We've got to get this bunch in, and we've got to get them out. Yeah. We've got... It's everything is so timed and so calculated yeah. that, um, you know, we, we don't give God the opportunity to move in the service. It's so regimented. It's so structured as, as you said, you know, we, we just, uh, yeah. we got our program, we got our program brother and we're sticking to it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, I understand it's a difficult decision for people that have four services or something, uh, I personally don't believe they had 3000 saved on the day of Pentecost and they didn't have a big church. They met in homes. So God could still move in the homes. I don't know the answer for that, except if, if, if you're going to continue on with your church program, basically. Okay. On Sundays, go ahead, do your timed services but God's moving, and so that Sunday night service is open, ended, and Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday. When when uh, we were in revival, I've only I've, I was one in Pampa, Texas. We went seven weeks, uh, and what we ended up doing was Sunday mornings. All the churches had their own service. And they could take their own offering because we know churches need money to function and pay people and turn the lights on. Sunday night, we moved it from the church to the Civic Center. And so Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night was revival services. And then the people were off Thursday and Friday and Saturday to rest, to do their household chores, whatever. Because one of the things that can quench revival is, is weariness. And so I learned that from Mario Murillo that we would go Monday through, or Sunday through Wednesday, and then the people could rest and do what they needed to do and then come back again Sunday night for the revival. But the churches had Sunday morning to carry on. And there shouldn't be any complaints of that because now most churches don't have a Sunday night service. So, you know, it, it's the same thing kind of veering off track here. Uh, a lot of the churches, I think, where we have failed and why we need revival is we have become an evangelistic center. Every Sunday morning in a lot of churches, it's all about salvation. Well, you've got people, the church is not for salvation. Church is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We are to go out and win people to Christ. But when we come together as a body of Christ, nobody's really needing to get saved. We need to be equipped. We need to know and be taught the things of God to grow in the Lord. I think one of the reasons that our young people have fallen off from the faith because uh, we haven't taught them what they believe, why they believe it. And I firmly believe that mixed in with revival here, 
because I've got all this through just the hunger for God. I don't worship revival. I just know we need it. But Christian apologetics is not for the world. It's for the church. I haven't won very many people with my Christian apologetics, but I have strengthened the body of Christ to give them a reason to know what they believe and why they believe it. And when somebody challenges what they believe, they don't skirmish like a little whipped puppy and then leave the faith because they didn't have any answers. And so when we're revived and we're brought back to life, then we need to get back to teaching from the book of Acts, teaching what we believe and why we believe it and equipping them to defend their faith and to contend for revival where they need, when they see it, this place needs revival. When I first uh, came to Austin to pastor, the Lord said, what kind of church do you want? And I said, a revival church. He said, no, you don't. I said, yes, I do. <laughs> and he said, no, you don't. I said, Lord, I'm a revivalist. I want a revival church. He said, revivals for dead churches. You want a healthy church. You can't live in revival. Our bodies are not created to live in revival. It, it, the, I've been in, in I want to say, three, maybe four revivals in my life. True outpouring moves of God. I've been in where services started at seven and we didn't finish till midnight. And I didn't try to prolong it. The people just couldn't leave. And man, it can get tiring. And so, and I mean, just, you've got to go about your everyday life, but you can go through it as a healthy, my goodness, when you were fighting COVID and you came out of that hospital, you weren't full throttle. You had to build to that. And you live a healthy life now. And the church has to learn revival is for a dead church. Now, I think we can look at America and we can see dead churches, but we can also see apostate churches. And there's a difference. They've left the faith. They've created their own tailor-made Jesus. But the dead church is people that's just still going through the motions and, and they don't even know they're dead. Dead people don't know they're dead. And when God comes in power, and usually there's one or two people there, they're praying, they're meeting together, they're talking, they're reading, they're hungering. And Tanya loves, my wife, she loves the weather. And her favorite is lightning storms. If we go to the beach, she prays at least one night for a lightning storm. And, and, I, and I learned from her that that electricity, there's a lightning, there's a tracer. It's looking for something to strike, to manifest itself. And I just called it a lightning tracer. And the lightning is from ground to earth, I mean, to heaven. But it's looking for something that it can strike to manifest. And I think that's a great analogy of the, the spirit of God. He's looking for a man standing in the gap or a woman or a group of people. And, and it doesn't take a lot. If they will just pray and be one spirit in one tongue, crying out to God for revival, and God sees their passion and God sees their heart. And we know it's his will for his church to be healthy and living again and manifesting his power and his joy and his passion that in him we live and move and have our being. And, and he, you know, when, when you have this, those around you will either want it or they will distance themselves from you because you're too radical. And really, it's not me, but it's the fire of God in me. And he made me a new creature in Christ. And I don't try to go around and, and just push. Jesus is my life. 
He is my passion. He's what I get excited about. He's what I wake up in the morning thinking about. I want, I'm 47 years old in the Lord and I want to know him. And I hadn't scratched the surface. How do you know fully an uncreated being that we know is our God? And folks get satisfied. I'm going to heaven. That's all that matters. Don't get carried away, you know, and and then all of a sudden, don't rock the boat. Don't challenge what's going on in our nation. Don't involve politics. See, when you revival hits, it hits everything. Yeah, it, it affects the culture. The whole thing. And the devil, I think, has been uh, smart. Of course, he's, he's wise, not wiser than God. But he took the sins that the Bible condemns. The murdering of the unborn, shedding innocent blood, homosexuality, all of these, uh, and the devil brought it into politics. So the church would say, "Oh, I can't talk about this stuff because of separation of church and state. I don't want to. I don't want to involve politics into my sermon." So the devil brought everything that God said. This is forbidden. And they started legalizing it. And the church says, okay, you've, what we should say, you've invaded my territory now. I will not stay out of it. If it was just about taxes, fine. Y'all can debate that. But now you've gotten into the word of God and you're usurping the authority of God. And now I will not bow to your idols. And we got too many preachers out there that's hiding behind the scripture you know, to submit to those in authority. They've been given power. They've been given power to execute and wield the sword to punish evil. And we've got a culture now that punishes good. And so Jesus was crucified because he went against the authority because they had usurped the authority. Uh, you look at all the martyrs. They were martyred because... They were going against the authority. And so, you know, you you look at that and you look at all throughout scriptures, they're not martyred because they compromised. They martyred because they said, I cannot follow you here. This is where the line is drawn. And we've got a lot of preachers, especially with the churches that are influential, that are on TV, that are in the city. And they won't stand for righteousness. And either they're going to be sucked into revival someplace or Ichabod is going to be written upon the door. God is not here. And I think it was Tozer again who said, you know, if the Holy Spirit left our churches today, 95% of what we're doing would continue and they wouldn't even know he's left. If the Holy Spirit left the New Testament church, 95% of the stuff they were doing would stop. Yeah, absolutely. That's revival. It is. Uh, I was uh, sharing with some people Saturday. I was preaching to a group, and I was preaching on, you know, what God wants the most, he gets the least of. And, uh, you know, a, yeah. lot of people, a lot of people think Jesus was some— you know, bearded woman, a feminine or something like that. Yeah. No, no, no. He was very masculine. He put the cords together, whipped the folks, flipped the the money changers, turned over the tables, and he told yeah. them, he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Yeah. And if I look at most services today, Mike, uh, I, I would say we've turned them into houses of preaching. We've turned them into houses of singing. Uh, man, if, if there is two minutes, if there's two minutes of silence, it's like everybody freaks out. Yeah. You know, so I kind of kind of hit a button there, you know, um, yeah. houses of prayer. You know, yeah. uh, you, you mentioned about the early church and revival and how prayer really is a prerequisite, prerequisite yeah. to 
to that. You know, you have not because you ask not. Uh, you know, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, yeah. If you'll pray, yeah. Seek me, yeah. You know, um, I, I always we used say, to, we used to call them prayer meetings. You know, we used to, we used to have prayer meetings. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And there was a pastor I won't name him, but he had a church of twenty thousand, and. They prayed on a certain nights, which praise God, at least they were having prayer meetings, right? So this is not a commentary on him. It's a commentary on the church. 500 people came out once a week to pray out of 20,000. So you, the, it tells you that 500 are really true disciples of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying the others are going to hell. They're believers but they're not followers of Jesus. They're not disciples. And that word Christian means like Christ. And so it's just a, a commentary uh, that uh, it needs to be preached on. It needs to be taught on. And there needs to be special services. Are you hearing this beacon? Good. But there's got to be a teaching to the people what their instructions are, you know, and prepare them to go to battle, just like they do in boot camp. These Navy SEALs that go through BUDS, they're not sending you through BUDS to see how many they can keep. <laughs> they're sending you through BUDS to see how many can get rid of. Because when you go to battle, you want these you can depend on. And I'm speaking as a novice. I don't know anything about it. I just, what I read and everything. That's a principle that the Lord used with Gideon. Yeah, he did. He did. And we're, we're so bent on trying to keep so many coming because it makes us look good. Uh, I was at a guy's church Sunday. I won't name him, but he has a bestseller uh, on Amazon, number one right now. And he's very controversial. Uh, has a website that now Facebook has basically won't let him make money on it and neither will YouTube. And he used to make a lot of money on it. Anyway, my friends we were with go to his church. And so we went and I was, I was shocked when I walked in that there were probably no more than 20 people there, you know? And Yet, I bet you all 20 of them were totally all in on the things of God, right? And so you could get 20 more that could deflate the other 20. I would rather have 20 warriors. I'd rather have five Navy SEALs or Green Berets than 30 or 40, 50, 100 civilians. If I'm going, if somebody, you know, going to come to my property and protect me, give me the five Navy SEALs or the Green Berets. The other guys, y'all can stay. The other 100, y'all can just stay. <laughs> and, and that's what it, you know, revival is just a, it's a powerful thing that changes everything. We're not going to get everybody saved. And we're not going to change the culture, I don't believe. But we're going to make a dent, a major dent. And, you know, the Christian block, it should be the very thing that politicians fear the most. That we should be so united according to the word of God and what we believe. You're not going to win an election without the church. And, and these guys that say, well, we shouldn't get involved in politics. Okay, fine. Go look at Iran. Go over, you know, to uh, Palestine today where Hamas just beheaded babies. Somebody's going to choose our leaders. Do I want the heathen choosing my leaders or do I want the church of Jesus Christ? Do I want radical Muslims choosing my leadership in America? Because the first thing they're going to do to those in the homosexual community, they're going to cut your head off. 
We Christians don't do that. We pray for you. We preach the truth. We try to warn you from the life to come. But we don't take vengeance in our own hand and cut your head off because you're homosexual. So if we don't get involved, and I think re revival stirs you up. It makes you more patriotic. Uh, gives you a fire for God to see God move on your nation. You know, to be glorified in your nation. And... Uh, so it's great that we have Christian leaders or leaders that are friendly to the church. But our nation is not going to change until God comes down in power and shakes this nation with the power of the Holy Spirit and lives are converted and hearts are changed and minds are changed. And you don't have to pass a law. People are not going to abort their babies because they're saved now. They're on fire for God. You, all of these these laws that we have that we've created is because man thinks that he's free to do what he wants to do. And revival just brings you right back to Jesus and Christ and him crucified. And I am in awe of this mighty God. And when I wrote this book, Contending for Revival, you know, it was just things that I saw that needed to happen in the church that has happened in the past history with Finney and all the other John Wesley, uh, that this is what has happened in the past. And we either learn from history, you know, or we repeat it. Well, sometimes we learn from history that we want to repeat. And that's the, all that we've got. And we got it in scripture. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. I'll heal their land. But it's not the world. If we don't have revival in America, it's not because of the sin. It's because of a lackluster church that doesn't have the vision of God to see a nation transformed by the power of God. We were born supernaturally. I think we should go out supernaturally. Mm -hmm. I look at the church today, Mike, and read myself, and, you know, I, I was just looking, reading through Revelations and, the you know, Christ's words to the Laodicean church. Yeah. You know, in, in America, I could say, you know, you say you're rich and increase with goods. You know, boy, is that not a picture of a lot of churches? Sure, there's some churches that are struggling, but yeah. by and large here in America, we are so blessed financially with funds and money yeah. and uh, but god sees the church completely different he said you know not that you're poor yeah. you're spiritually poor you're miserable mm -hmm. you're blind you you have no spiritual insight no revelation yeah and uh, you know you you can't see uh the things in the spirit what i what i want to do what i'm trying to do and yeah uh you know we use that scripture in 320 in revelation Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's kind of an evangelistic type mm -hmm. tool. But uh, that scripture is basically God is standing outside of his church, yeah. not inside. You know, we can say, you know, we're two or three are gathered in my name, but God's saying, I'm outside the church. I'm knocking on the door of the church. I'm not knocking yeah. on the door of some uh, unrepentant sinner. I'm trying to yeah. get in the church. Yeah. And, um, uh, Boy, that's just such a convicting passage. Yeah. And, you know, the church is the greatest thing this world has ever seen. And e even what we have in America. And and I know the struggles, but, you know, I know pastors have to. Well, they should be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, not to do life how to grow in Christ, how to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I think that too many of them have gotten off track from the seeker friendly movement. And now it's basically the Walmarting of the church. They just go to cities and they have money and all this excitement and blow up stuff, children's stuff. And they all of a sudden have 200 people in a month. The people they got were from other churches. And so 
they're just moving furniture on the Titanic. They're not doing anything with the sinking ship. And, you know, and it's most visible. If you go to these rural, rural, rural towns and these smaller churches, they're passionate about God. They're serious about the Lord. It's the young, and I'm not painting everybody in this, but it's the upstart churches, the skinny jeans, be cool, look cool, know the latest thing about computers and Instagram or whatever, have a big blow up on your Twitter feed and be this guy and that guy. We've seen it happening in our world and these guys end up falling because they weren't ready for that. And I don't believe they started out that way, but my goodness, the temptation, Billy Graham was amazing not to fall to that. But uh, like I said, they can teach. They, that's what Sunday school, you could have Sunday school classes. You can teach them the things of the scriptures and, and living principles from the scriptures, but the scriptures are not about living principles. They're about a living God. And if we usurp that and just use it as good principles to live by, we're no better than, than the Muslims who believe in Jesus as a good prophet, but they don't believe he's the son of God. And so, uh, but there are churches that they are preaching, you know, they may be running 1,200 or 1,400 and they're baptizing people every Sunday and they're going out and they're evangelizing and they're knocking on doors you can still have people saved on a consistent basis and not have revival. A lot of people think we're revival so people will get saved. No, you can have that but because revival deals with the church. And so what people need to do is if they're in a church that is just caught up in the time and and, and you'll have no place to go because all the churches are like that around there is pray for that pastor to be stirred. Pray for God to wake him up in the middle of the night. D.L. Moody, great preacher from Chicago, preached, and there were two ladies that sat on the front row. And while he was preaching, they were praying. And so one day he said to them, when I'm preaching, I noticed y'all are praying. He said, what are y'all praying for? And she said, they said, we're praying for you. They said, you need the Holy Spirit. You need the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I got the largest church in Chicago. People are getting saved in my services. What do you mean I need the Holy Spirit? And Sunday after Sunday, they come back. He'd see them praying, you know. And uh, one day he was in New York City and the Holy Spirit came upon him and he had to dash off into an alley because the power was so strong upon his body, he couldn't hardly stand it. And the and just the love gushing out of him and the power. And he said from that day forward, his sermons didn't change. But people that was responding and the power that was being manifest in his services was incredible. And uh, they have good hearts. And until they're in the throes of God themselves. And then they say, okay, I'd rather have this than anything else. And with their teaching ability that God gave them and their leadership ability that God gave them, they could put a passion in their church for a move of God instead of a cool pepperelli sermon. We don't need pepper rallies. Christians are not meant to live in a pepper rally on a high. We're meant to live in the middle, that radical middle, where we are just steady and consistent. Sometimes we'll hit a high, and sometimes we'll hit a low, but most of the time we're just right in here. If you get up here, when you come down, revival will end up taking you up. And when it lifts and you're back in the radical middle, you need to walk in the things of God and stay consistent with the Lord and passionate of the Lord. 
and not try to recreate this, which quenches the spirit and causes all sorts of problems. And then don't suppress it, but just live in the radical middle and expect God to move. And But to pray for these preachers that their eyes would be open because if they go to bed at night just like you and me and they have dreams. And so, you know, what I do is I just pray not in a self-righteous way. Like my, Mike Stevens is no better. I mean, there I've got flaws and my way is not the perfect way. And uh, I just want God and I want his presence in the services. Uh, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1980, there wasn't a Southern Baptist church that I went to that lifted their hands to worship God. And today, you go into a Southern Baptist church, there are going to be people lifting their hands worshiping God. That is big for a Southern Baptist church. And, and so I know that my heart is revival. That is my passion. I know that revival may not be the passion of that pastor. You know, and I can't be too harsh on him because he doesn't have the calling on his life that I have. He's got a calling of, and he got to deal with people going through divorce, children's, you know, committed suicide, uh, the culture. He's got so many subjects he's got to cover every Sunday uh, to try to, you know, what gets bad is if he just gets lazy and doesn't pray and get in the pulpit without a broken heart. And uh, because I know there's a, as a, as an evangelist and we can put in there revivalist, uh, they bring you in to hit a home run. You're a pinch hitter and a pastor, man, he's batting for average. He's just trying to get on base and get a 300, 400 average. And every now and then hits a home run. And so, you know, there was revivals that I was in. You know, one of them was when the joy of the Lord just started falling on people. That happened to me. And for about 1996 to 2001, that was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And my friend Mario Murillo was very hesitant toward it. And I remember saying to Mario as we were having supper one night, Mario, you have a different ministry. Your ministry is truly to the lost. This is to the church. If you turned your meetings into this, it would lose the anointing that God had placed on you to win the lost. And so Billy Graham there were things that God withheld from him that I might have had because of the, the, the goal that Billy was called to, to do, the mission. And But I don't believe anybody could say Billy Graham was not spirit-filled because he, tr he truly was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He might not have been baptized in the Spirit where there were power gifts, but, the, but spirit filled is about holiness and being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Just like don't be drunk with wine because it's debauchery. But he contrasts it with but be filled with the spirit. Well, if you're drunk with wine, you're under the influence. Wine, drugs, whatever. And God is saying, I want you to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit because he'll turn you into a different person, too. Yeah. Amen. Well, there's so many great quotes in your book. I just want to read one here uh, from General William Booth. Yeah. And uh, let's just. What chapter is that? It's just cuts. It's just cuts on page 23. It said, I consider the chief dangers confronting kind of the modern church will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without regeneration, morality without God, and heaven without hell. Yeah. 
And that's just almost prophetic. He yeah. wrote that and uh that's the pretty uh, powerful. That's the book I'm writing right now. I'm writing and covering each one of those that he said was the greatest danger. I just finished religion without the Holy Spirit. And now I'm working on the chapter Christianity without Christ because it sounds like an oxymoron, but it is a antichrist. And we call him Christ, but it's an antichrist spirit. It's a substitute. But I, that quote, I was starting another book and I started out with that quote. And when I saw the quote, I felt like the Lord say, that's your book. You're going to take each point and make a chapter out of each point because it has come to pass. And it, it doesn't mean it has to stay here. When we realize that we've got something, then we're looking for the cure. And so people not all in to these, you know, medicines or, or research you may not think much about cancer, but when you're diagnosed with cancer, the first question you ask is, what can you do? You're wanting a solution. And that, to me, is when you see the condition of your culture or yourself, what can I do? And God gives us the answers in his word and through his relationship with him. But we don't really seek the cure until it becomes personal. And I think it's gotten, Ken, so personal in America. I do believe we're in a type of revival now. We've got people that may not speak our language. I'm not saying revival is going to make you, uh, your, your vocabulary of some of the cuss words. I know people that have been born again and they're on fire for God and they'll still drop a word here and there, but I see more fire in them than someone that's walking the line of, of legalism uh, without the spirit. And so I believe God is moving upon people. Donald Trump being one, I don't know where he's at in his faith, but I know he talks about the Lord. I know he's on his radar. Yeah, he's a politician. He could be using it. Well, maybe so, but he did more that way to put abortion laws federally out, give it back to the state, that moved the embassy to Jerusalem. So he's done some stuff. And, and, and you hear people, you watch them on Twitter or you see them on whatever post or podcast. I mean, I've watched Megan Kelly on her podcast and now she's really getting involved in her faith and seeking the Lord. She has Charlie Kirk on and she'll say a few words and apologize. I know that wasn't Christian. And I'm Joe Rogan now, he's got people on his podcast that's been converted and talking about the Lord and and. I think we are in a type of, of revival in the church where they've gotten bold and that spiritual awakening is taking place. And so, and it might be, Ken, the 60s, we had a spiritual awakening without revival. The church wasn't ready. God said, I can't wait on you. And he fell on a generation. And they came in with their bare feet and Jesus Revolution movie was about that. God bypassed the church to reach the people. And then a few churches got involved and said, hey, yeah, we're going to partner with you. It could be like that again. But I do know that there's a move of God in America. And it has to do, too, with being very patriotic because it's taking us back to the foundation and our foundation is faith in Jesus Christ. And when you got people like Bill Maher talking about how crazy the left has gotten, something's going on. And so the church doesn't need to fumble the ball. If they become woke, they will win nobody to Christ. They will have no move of God. But if they become awakened, by the spirit of God, 
then they'll transform lives and their city will be impacted. You will know that church is very dominant, very visible, very powerful, very influential. We better watch ourselves. We need that church on our side. And, you know, and that's, it just builds, you know what I'm saying? And we, we go through seasons and it dies down. This is what's exciting. I know I'm talking too much, but this is what's exciting in history. Revival comes and it hits. And then when it lifts, the next generation tries to duplicate what was in the revival. It's all carnal. And then the next generation don't want to have anything to do with it at all. The next generation, they want their granddaddy's church. And their granddaddy's church was revival. And we're in that generation now. And so these kids want a real encounter with God. They don't want to hear about money, fundraising. You know, they don't want anything fake, but they're open to everything that's real. And uh, and they're radical. You know, they, they, they've got their tattoos all the way up to their neck. And they're out there and they're they're demanding godliness. You know, they're they're living off the grid <laughs> and they're just passionate for God. And they know what they believe. And they're really engaged in the scripture and some of the old authors, not the new ones, but the older ones. And, uh, you know, my friend Mario Murillo is still out there with his tent doing evangelistic services. And, and just people are just coming to Christ because they see how bad it is. And they've heard their grandmama and their granddaddy's preachers preach about the end times and they go, you know what? This kind of looks like it. And so I better come home. And we don't, we don't know our eschatology is perfect or not, but we got to go with what we've got. And it just puts a passion in me to say, how much longer will God put up with a governor in California taking parental rights away from parents so their kids can get you know transitioned into whatever they want to be and uh flaunt around almost nude doing drag queen shows in libraries and mocking god dressing up as nuns and how much will god finally say enough is enough and so our job is for us to be revived because when you are revived and revival will thrust you into the streets and you won't have to preach a sermon on soul winning. They just go out and talk about what Jesus is doing. And there's no simple method. People just start coming to Christ. That's just what the Jesus movement was about. There was not deep theology there. They just preach Christ and him crucified. And, uh, you know, so I think when I look at revival and I've studied it and my friend Winky Prattney is my mentor. And I think he's the world's most uh, knowledgeable man in the world on revival. And uh, you don't know what the next one's going to look like. You might be the, you might be the very one that fights it. So I got to be careful that says, okay, it's got to come this way. No, I need to have my spiritual ears open. When it hits, I go, that's it. I'm going to tell you, it's scary. It is scary. Uh, God doesn't care about your dignity, your reputation. And if, if people think revival comes and everything's hunky-dory and good, no, you be, you, you're talked about, you're persecuted, you're disliked. Uh, and, and you go, God, what are you, you're ruining my ministry. <laughs> you know? And do you want me 
or do you want a successful ministry in the world's eyes, in the church's eyes? And uh, so I don't know what this, the next one looks like. And I want to just be in tune with God that I'm not the Saul that's trying to kill the David. Yesterday, man, as R.T. Kendall says, trying to kill today's man. And I just want to be, and, and that's, you know, these young preachers, some of them are doing great jobs. And, uh, but these people need to know, I get so tired of hearing about the church being, you know, you're broken. You know, you need to come to the Lord and give your life to Jesus because you're broken and wounded. No, you are a sinner. You are enemy of God. And if you die, you're going to hell because you are at war with God. They don't think they've done anything wrong. They're just broken and wounded and hurt. And I just need someone to just wrap me in their arms and just pat me on the back and love on me. And Jesus said, repent. <laughs> you know, so they don't think they've done anything wrong. So the worship a lot of it is a romantic relationship instead of a godly relationship. It's a romance. And love loves me just the way I am. And, you know, and God says, I died to change you. I loved you before while you were an enemy of mine, while you were mocking me, while you were touting yourself putting me down with your lifestyle. I loved you then. But I said, you must be born again. And that born again experience makes us a new creature in Christ, which means things change. And you shall know them by their fruit. Yeah, I've heard it said, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, uh, I just need to turn over a new leaf and get better. But, you know, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. No. Nope. Jesus came to make dead people like us live. Amen. You know, you're That's dead. Right. You're That's dead right. in your trespasses and sin. Yeah. You're dead. Yeah. Jesus came to give us life by the Spirit. Yep. Yeah. And they don't know that. And then when they're disciplined with the word, they get mad and they leave and they say, that church just judged me, you know. No, the word of God judges all of us. Every, all of us on the same playing field. Same word that judges you, judges me. God is preparing us for heaven. And he doesn't have rebels. He has followers. 